Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at DNA profiling, the extraction of DNA, DNA digestion, producing the DNA profile, interpreting DNA profiles, and then we'll finish with the summary. DNA profiling, which is also called genetic fingerprinting, is a particular method that we use to produce a specific pattern of DNA bands from an individual's genome. So remember, the genome of an individual contains all of the genes and therefore all of the genetic material in the whole cell and therefore the whole code for that individual. So every nucleus that you have in every cell will contain the entire set of DNA that you own. And what we can do is we can make a specific pattern or a set of bands which show all of the different sections of DNA in somebody's genome, which you can imagine would be a pretty huge band. But every individual is unique and has a different set of DNA apart from twins. So we call it their genetic fingerprint. Every individual organism has a unique genome and therefore everyone has their own unique DNA profile or genetic fingerprint. So your genetic fingerprint will look different to somebody else's. The only exception is if we have identical twins. The DNA profiling method relies on short repeating sequences of DNA which are found within the genome in the non-coding regions of DNA. So remember, in DNA we have two types of regions of nucleotides. We have coding regions, which code for the proteins that make up the body, and we have non-coding regions. There's actually more non-coding than coding found in the entire genome, and they have various and some of them quite mysterious functions. But there are repeating sequences in these non-coding areas that we use to carry out this DNA profiling technique. And these repeating sequences that we see are known as variable number tandem repeats, so VNTRs. So it's just a varying number of tandem repeats. That means that the repeats can be of a various number. They might repeat 10 times or 100 times. That's why we call them variable tandem repeats. These sections, or VNTRs, are found in more than 1,000 different locations in the human genome. So here's a general picture of the human genome, containing all the pairs of chromosomes that make up an individual human. Of course, everyone's genome will be slightly different and have variations but there's particular locations in the genome, of which there are roughly a thousand, where we have these repeats in the non-coding region of DNA. In every single individual, the VNTRs at each loci, or each location, will differ in the number of repeats. So for example, at position number one, one individual may have one repeat, whereas another individual may have two repeats. So at one location, every individual has a different number of repeats. This means that each individual, therefore, contains VNTRs which differ in length at different locations, which means they have a completely unique DNA profile. The first stage of DNA profiling involves extracting the DNA from the tissue samples of the individual. So from the tissues, we obviously have cells, and the cells are going to contain the genome of that individual. And we need to take the genome from one of these cells. The DNA can be obtained in a variety of different ways. It can be extracted from cheek cells collected by a mouth swab. So the mouth swab has a cotton sort of ball on the end, and as it rubs against the cheek, it removes some cells, and then those cells can be taken and analyzed. The DNA can be extracted from the remains of blood, hair, or skin cells. So for example, at a crime scene. We can also obtain ancient DNA, for example, DNA from extinct animals, and it can be taken from inside old bones. So long bones, tend to have a center which is soft because it contains bone marrow. And the bone marrow has many cells in it where we make the blood cells, and these will of course contain DNA. Before the DNA profiling process is carried out, the DNA has to be amplified using the PCR reaction. Remember, PCR is the polymerase chain reaction. And in the polymerase chain reaction, we take a strand of DNA and we multiply it many, many times so that we've got many copies to work with and in case one gets damaged, we've got many backup supplies with which to do the test. Once the DNA has been extracted from the individual and it's been amplified with PCR, the DNA is then digested by cutting it into smaller fragments using restriction endonucleases. So remember, DNA is a very, very long molecule and it's so long that it would be inefficient to work the reaction on one massive molecule. So we cut it up into sections to make it more manageable. And the enzymes that do this are known as restriction endonucleases. By definition, restriction endonucleases are a type of enzyme that cut up DNA at a specific sequence of bases known as recognition sites. 
So remember, enzymes work on substrates by recognizing their shape. The enzyme's active site in this case recognizes particular sequences of nucleotides, and this sequence is known as a recognition site. The recognition site comes into the enzyme, and then the enzyme can work digesting the DNA into smaller fragments that are more manageable. The specific restriction endonucleases are used to cut the DNA into fragments that leaves the VNTRs intact. So remember, these repeats inside the non-coding areas need to be kept intact because this is what helps us make that unique DNA profile. So the enzyme that cuts the DNA must not recognize and cut VNTRs. So the recognition site must not have anything contained within these VNTRs. Since the VNTRs differ in length between individuals, the DNA fragments taken from different individuals will also be different in size. So for example, if someone has many repeats and the enzyme is unable to cut within that area, the enzyme is going to cut it either side, leaving a long fragment. Whereas if someone only has two repeats like up here, then that fragment is going to be much shorter. So people have different repeats and different places for these repeats, and therefore they will have different fragment lengths. The DNA fragments that we've made then get separated out by gel electrophoresis. Remember this separates based on the size of the DNA fragments, where if we started here, the smallest ones move further, the larger ones move less. So because of this, smaller fragments travel quicker and therefore they move further along the gel in a given amount of time. So if we started at this end again, smaller ones make it further along the gel, larger ones make less of a distance. So vice versa, larger fragments travel slower and therefore they move less far along the gel. And the reason they move less far is because they're so long and the gel is kind of opposing their movement and so they're going to take longer to get to a specific distance. When it's finished, the gel electrophoresis makes a banding pattern which is going to be unique to every single individual because everyone will have different lengths of fragments and different fragments based on the number of repeats that they had. So all of these bands are going to be unique in their size and in their position for individual A, individual B, individual C, and so on across the whole population. The banding pattern can be visualized by using dyes or probes, which can be radioactive or fluorescent. So when the DNA is run through the gel, we still can't see the DNA because it's very small, but we could have fluorescent dyes, which obviously give off a particular signal or color, or we can have radioactive dyes or probes, which give off things like X-ray signals. The unique banding pattern that we make is called the DNA profile or the genetic fingerprint. Once the DNA profile for each sample of DNA has been produced, the different DNA profiles can be compared to each other. So when we compare two individuals' DNA profiles, for example A and B, we can see similarities in the genome and we can see differences too. So people who are more similar in their genetics will have a more similar DNA profile. If the DNA profile from two different samples are very much the same, this suggests that the DNA samples were taken from the same people. So if one person was at two different locations and we found DNA for both, we could say this was found at location A, for example during a crime scene, and we can see this was seen at location B, and you can see that these ones are identical. These are not the same. But these two are the same, which means that this is the same individual. If the DNA profile from two different samples have around half the DNA bands in common, this suggests a close genetic relationship. So for example here we can see that they share about 50% of those bands, which means that they're probably genetically related because the alleles and genes have been shared or inherited. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.